Maybe that means it's time for us to start. Um, it's with great pleasure that I welcome Kelly Irby to a session which is a joint session of Thursdays at 4 and the Quadrant Program. As many of you in the audience know, the Quadrant Program is a joint program between the Institute for Advanced Study and the University of Minnesota Press where we bring in scholars whose work is of mutual interest to the Institute and the Press um, to present a public talk and then to workshop um, chapters of work in progress. And um, so we are, today we're welcome, welcoming Kelly Irby, uh, who received her PhD from Emory earlier this year. She's now teaching at Georgia State. Um, she um, has uh, written uh, several articles of interest and is actually um, involved in something that I know nothing about, but maybe we can talk about it in the question and answer. Uh, she's involved in a public history exhibit called Portrait and Text, African American Artists of Dance, Music, and the Written Word, um, which um, will be um, an, discussed um, in Marble Magazine forthcoming in January of 2011. Um, she also has an article called Worthy of Respect, Black Waiters in Boston Before the Civil War, which came out a couple of years ago in Food and History. And her talk today is, as you can see, entitled From Johnny Cake to Escargot, Commercial Dimey, Social Hierarchy and Identity in Antebellum America. There is a handout um, just outside the door. Um, if anyone neglected to pick up a handout, if you could raise your hand, Susanna will, will, Susanna will fix it. Um, that is her job around here. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll turn the floor over to you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for inviting me to campus this week. I'm really delighted to be here, and thank you for coming to this presentation, too. Um, I thought I would start by just trying to situate the paper I'm going to present today in terms of my larger research project. Um, broadly speaking, my research interests um, focus on public, on popular culture and how it has anchored Americans in common experience, um, but how it has also been used to reflect and define um, demarcations in race, ethnicity, gender, class, religion, etc. Um, in that context, I'm currently investigating the emergence of commercial dining in America. Um, before about the 1820s, Americans did not, in fact, dine out. Um, my project is both social and cultural history. Uh, I'm also interested in space. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the way restaurants were simultaneously um, zones that were public and that they were extra domestic outside the home. Um, and yet they're also clearly bounded. And by bounded, I mean that um, restaurants could control and restrict their clientele on, based on various measures, including cost. Um, also, um, restaurants accommodated many diners at once, but yet diners set apart from strangers at distinct tables, uh, et cetera. Um, I argue that as these unique kinds of semi-public spaces, restaurants cultivated the expression of difference among groups in America. Um, but at the same time, they also help to foster an awareness and even an appreciation of America's um, growing cultural diversity. So um, in this paper, I have attempted to sort of give a broad overview, overview a taste, as it were, of um, some of the developments and themes in my larger project. Um, first, I will explain why and how Americans first began to dine outside the home. Um, and then I will um, examine a little bit of, of the special allure that French cuisine had in the antebellum period um, before turning briefly to some of the criticisms that um, dining out inspired by the 1850s and 1860s. So, and then I look forward to questions. Um, Amelia Simmons' 1796 cookbook, American Cookery, outlined the basic contours of dining in the Young Republic. Um, turkey, Simmons intoned, was the queen of all birds. 
while garlics were better adapted to medicine than cookery. <laughs> the first cookbook published by an American, Simmons Treatise, provided instructions on how to prepare such um, dishes that were a mishmash of fami familiar English uh, culinary practices like roasting and boiling and such distinctly North American ingredients as cornmeal, pumpkin, and molasses. Uh, Simmons' book celebrated this straightforward approach to cooking as being specially adapted to Republican values and integral to American culinary identity and even national pride. Um, Simmons' introduction to the book also reflected the fact that cooking, a duty that was both biological and patriotic, according to its author, was a core responsibility of American housewives. At the turn of the century, cooking and eating were in America were overwhelmingly domestic <coughs> activities. Um, by the antebellum period, however, life in America underwent significant change that deeply affected the nation's foodways. Northeastern cities like Boston became further urban and industrial. Um, class differences widened. Immigration increased sixfold between 1840 and 1860, while the reach of the market economy extended deeper and deeper into everyday life. These developments ushered in the urban trend of dining and commercial restaurants in America, transforming where urbanites ate as well as what they ate and with whom they ate. Anxieties about the new direction of American culinary routines restrained some of the effects of these changes until later in the century, but proved unable to restore cooking and eating in America to the uniform and straightforwardly <coughs> domestic activities Amelia Simmons had known. Um, until the, until the mid-1820s, <coughs> Americans rarely dined um, outside their homes. Commemorative celebrations and political banquets would draw white males from time to time to taverns for a meal, but these were special occasions. Um, taverns typically made drink available for purchase by local men, but they provided meals only to travelers. And um, even then, the meals were usually included in the price of lodging, which I think reflects the fact that these meals were provided out of necessity rather than something that were especially sought out. Um, as work in the industrializing Northeast steadily moved out of domestic spaces and as cities became more geographically specialized in terms of their spatial organization, um, dining routines <coughs> changed significantly. Uh, male workers found that uh, returning home in the middle of the day for the afternoon meal, which was the, then the biggest and the most important one of the day, uh, was time consuming and difficult. This was true for all men regardless of their economic position. Um, upper class merchants and professionals now often resided in suburbs with their families and they found that going home from the city more than once per day was out of the question. Working in middle class laborers uh, and clerks typically did live closer to their workplaces but returning home in the afternoon could still be problematic given the short amount of time they were permitted in which to eat and the various kinds of obstacles they might encounter on the way home. Um, the option to instead <coughs> purchase a meal from a commercial eatery in close proximity to their place of work thus became more and more attractive for all classes of men throughout the antebellum years uh, and increasing numbers of urbanites thus began to take their meals not at home but in public commercial restaurants. Restaurants were a novel but quickly proliferating trend in urban America um, that strove to meet America's new Americans' new commercial <coughs> appetites. For instance, Boston City Directory listed hundreds of eating houses, oyster saloons, dining rooms, and lunch rooms um, by 1860. Though men from all different social backgrounds began to look to restaurants to provide meals for them, discrete constituencies patronized distinct venues. The dining experience um, these venues provided varied tremendously depending on their clientele. For example, laboring men ate at midday among other working class men in establishments that endeavored to provide a dining experience that fit both their cultural appetites and their pocketbooks. Um, many of these eateries catered to specific groups of non-English immigrant workers some accommodated black workers, but many did not. Meals in working class venues emphasized affordability and function. <coughs> Hungry workers, um, perhaps still sweaty from their morning's work, ate in a rush along counters that were known as boards um, in order to get back to their labors as expediently as possible. 
Um, they typically dined on potatoes and fatty cuts of meat that were cheap and were expected to provide adequate energy for the manual labor that they would have been doing. Uh, middle class men, on the other hand, took their noontime meals at venues where there was at least slightly greater emphasis on style and taste. Um, they provided luxuries working class eateries did not, including napkins, um, separate tables that were set wider apart in order to offer diners um, a sense of privacy, um, and also more attention to service and cleanliness. Many middle class venues did not sell alcohol. Uh, the bourgeoisie believed that their attention and appreciation to matters like temperance and cleanliness, even when dining out, helped to explain their elevated position in society. Middling people further believed such values made it likely that they would continue to be upwardly mobile. But middle class men, um, too, stressed speed and efficiency in their commercial dining practices. Only elite eateries focused on ritual and ceremony while at the public table. Um, throughout the antebellum years, the most refined dining venues in a city were those that were associated with uh, luxury hotels, lu public restaurants attached to luxury hotels. Examples of luxury hotels um, with renowned restaurants attached included the Tremont Houses, the Tremont House, House, the Revere House, and the Parker House in Boston. Um, there was the Astor House and the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York, and the American and Lafayette Houses in Philadelphia. There was also a small number of elegant standalone restaurants like Delmonico's in New York is probably the most famous one. Um, but typically, <coughs> large hotels financed by corporations were the best equipped to provide the high level of style and elegance that were required to attract a wealthy clientele in this period. Um, and I will discuss in greater detail later um, that meals in elite eateries combined opulence and decor, elaborate table service, and the best quality food, which usually was French food. Such establishments became the perfect arena in which affluent diners could showcase their own high level of refinement and thus justify their place in the socioeconomic um, order. Um, it wasn't just men who ate outside the home in the antebellum period, and some people are surprised by this, but um, as shopping duties became more central to middle and upper class women's activities, they too began to look to commercial dining venues to provide their midday meal for them. Um, working class women, however, did not dine outside the home in this period. Um, most, women, most occupations um, did not for women did not require them to take public meals, domestic service, home sewing, that kind of thing, did not require um, dining out at midday. Ladies dining venues were earmarked as respectable, safe havens for women within the otherwise dangerous city. They excluded the sale of alcohol and they barred male patronage except for men who were escorting women. But as an interesting side note, the waiters in ladies' dining venues were men. Such eateries specialized in light and sugary fare like fruits, cakes, and confectionery that were thought to both reflect and confirm a lady's delicate nature. <laughs> um, thus, as dinner moved out of the home, it moved into new and unique kinds of semi-public spaces that were once open and yet clearly bounded. As such, dining venues cultivated the expression of difference through the varying eating styles of discrete class, racial, ethnic, and gender groups. The range of dining establishments available in antebellum American cities also drew attention to the increasingly diverse and hierarchical nature of American society. But at the same time, urbanites from across the spectrum of social and economic positions increasingly participated in the trend. In other words, dining out simultaneously divided Americans, even as it also provided them with a shared experience. Um, there was yet another way, though, that antebellum dining venues encouraged contact between individuals from different social and economic backgrounds. Regardless of the clientele to which a particular um, venue catered, the waiters who worked um, in all venues were overwhelmingly either black or Irish working class men. Um, throughout the antebellum years, native-born white men were very reluctant to work as waiters. Uh, women were not eligible for the position until later in the century. White men believed that wagering was servile and degrading and unfit for true Republicans. And th these attitudes left the work um, for black and Irish men, people who had a few other occupational options. Um, 
For black and Irish men especially, waitering was one of the highest paying and least dangerous jobs of the limited number that were available to them, and they eagerly took the waitering jobs that white men scorned. Black and Irish waiters worked in all classes of eateries, even expensive and refined venues that catered to very wealthy clientele. Also venues, as I mentioned, that catered specifically to ladies. For some of these white native-born diners, particularly for women, um, interactions with waiters were some of the only contact they had with the black or Irish residents of their cities. Um, debating whether the sons of Ham or the sons of Aaron were better suited to be waiters became a way to assess the capabilities of these men as workers and also their potential as citizens. And you see these debates in periodicals, in newspapers, even in, in personal diaries throughout the 19th century. Um, Who is better, which, which race is better equipped to be a, a waiter? <laughs> Unfortunately, waiters from both backgrounds were often dismissed as slow, lazy, clumsy, which are obviously um, a reflection of the negative stereotypes that were associated with both groups. In some cases, though, diners were actually surprised by the excellent service and even skill that their waiter exhibited. Um, in fact, in Boston, after the passage of the second fugitive slave law, uh, restaurant proprietors organized networks of lookouts who would warn them when slave catchers came to town because they didn't want to risk losing some of their best employees. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, in 1855, an interracial union of waiters in New York City organized a wage increase, and newspapers reported that this, this, uh, this pay hike was warranted by the, the special skill and dedication that black and Irish uh, men as waiters uh, demonstrated. I wanted to show you this image of, um, this is Tunis Campbell, who um, was a black waiter. He worked in Boston in the 1840s. He eventually relocated to New York. In 1848, he published this book, Hotel Keepers, Head Waiters, and Housekeeper's Guide. Um, and this was an attempt to actually um, explain how waitering was skilled and why it should be more esteemed as an occupation. And it was also an attempt to say, look, African-American men are actually specially suited to be waiters. We are better than the Irish. Um, because <laughs> black waiters were increasingly facing competition from the influx of Irish immigrants. Again, they didn't want to lose these jobs, which they valued. Um, so this is one example of uh, this effort to say, you know, waitering is hard work, and, and we take it really seriously. Um, Interestingly, those who did the cooking in restaurants were, were also usually black or Irish men, but cook's labor was even more degraded than waiters. Um, cook, men like Tunis Campbell attempted at least to say that waiters were skilled. Um, you don't see that development among cooks. Cooks were generally paid less than waiters, um, and turnover was greater amongst waiters. Um, cooks took other work when they could get it. Um, moreover, cooks rarely interacted with the public they fed, which I think might be one reason, um, I'll, I'll return to the subject later, um, why cooks were thought of as beneath waiters. Um, kitchens were usually located in dungy basements, leaving the ground floor available for the dining room. Food was then transported upstairs by dumb waiters or fetched by waiters. Um, again, so that you never had interaction between the eating public and the cook. Cooks remained behind, behind, or in this case, below, to proceed with their labors in the kitchen. Um, venues that catered to middle and upper class patrons especially made every effort to confine cooks and cookery to the basement. Um, even cooks who prepared the complicated French cuisine that was becoming in vogue uh, failed to receive recognition for their culinary talents throughout the antebellum period. Um, they too, French cooks, well, people who prepared French cook, French food, were black or Irish, typically. Thus, as one of a limited number of integrated workplaces for much of the 19th century, restaurants brought different groups of Americans into contact with one another, immigrants and native-born, black and white, men and women, upper and lower classes. Um, but even as restaurants facilitated interactions between these different groups, they also certainly reflected divisions between them in society. I'll pause again to show you two more images. This one 
um, a little hard to see, but this is the main dining room of the Tremont House Hotel, um, which is known to be the first luxury hotel in America. Um, it had a very, very uh, refined and, and famous um, public restaurant attached to it. It actually had two dining rooms. One was marked for ladies, and only ladies and their escorts were allowed in the ladies' dining room. Um, and then this is an image of the main dining room where women were explicitly not allowed. And you can see in this image that it's all men. And then also they're all sitting around one large banquet table. Um, the banquet table goes away. It's phased out by the late 1840s, 1850s, because upper class patrons um, increasingly say that they want to sit at separate tables where they can have at least the illusion of privacy in this big crowded hall. Um, they don't have to sit with people they don't know. And you can see that in this image, which is from the 1850s, um, well, you can kind of see it, it's a little difficult. Um, but there are separate tables, and this is a ladies' eatery, and you, thank you. You can actually see men and women. Um, Could you turn that off? Thank you. Dining together in this venue. Um, and again, it's hard to see, but the waiters are men, however. So it's ladies and their escorts, and then male waiters. Thanks. So for the most part, throughout the antebellum <clears throat> years, um, the food, food did, ethnic food was not a prominent part of the dining landscape in this period. Um, it didn't become, ethnic food didn't become prominent in America until later in the century when you have a significant, this, the arrival of significant numbers of ethnic, um, of immigrants from Eastern Europe and from China. Um, the vast majority of eateries in the antebellum period dished up standard American fare, um, similar to the dishes Amelia Simmons had included re recipes for in her cookbook. Um, among the list of eating house standards were Cincinnati quail, otherwise known as pork, <laughs> <laughs> and also Boston strawberries, which must be baked beans. Elite dining venues, however, proved to be major exceptions in terms of the kinds of food they served. At the same time that dining began to move out of the home, French cookery became increasingly fashionable among affluent diners. Uh, this attraction to French cuisine in America stemmed not from an influx of French immigrants, but rather from a crisis uh, in culinary confidence among Americans themselves. And despite some complicated politics surrounding the popularity of French food, French cuisine came to define refined dining in antebellum America. France had begun to, distin had begun to distinguish itself in terms of cookery beginning in the Renaissance period. By the, by the French Revolution, they were well known throughout Europe for their elaborate cuisine. Um, and by the 18th century, table manners throughout Europe had also become increasingly elaborate. Uh, in France, where the aristocracy was centralized in Paris, social competition was especially strong, and manners at table were particularly elaborate and intricate. Um, also in France, it had become fashionable by the 19th century to serve meals in courses. Okay, so although American dining etiquette had experienced a transformation similar to Europe's in terms of becoming more, the dining etiquette becoming more elaborate, um, it continued to lag somewhat behind. At the same time, Americans were generally reluctant to incorporate French methods into their cookery, even into the early 19th century. Um, actually, Amelia Simmons directly criticizes the French. Um, despite France's own Republican Revolution, French cuisine seemed foppish to many Americans and out of step with their Republican ideals. After all, why should Americans regard foods that had once been reserved for French aristocracy as any better than the more rustic kinds of dishes that their colonial forefathers had known. Patrick Henry voiced such feelings when he criticized President Thomas Jefferson, who had returned from a visit to France with a taste for French food as Frenchified during his native victuals. By the 1830s and 1840s, however, Americans had developed certain insecurities about their own food waste. These anxieties were the result of decades of harsh criticism from European, especially English, guests at American <laughs> tables. <laughs> Scathing assessments of American food and table manners from writers like Francis Trollope and Charles Dickens particularly rankled. These writers concurred in condemning American cookery as greasy, 
as tasty, tasteless and as overly reliant on the use of onions. You see that <laughs> over and over again. Um, they found American fare in private households and in the country's burgeoning commercial dining um, venues as abundant, but as uh, tasteless, you know, lacking all uh, skill in preparation. Um, meanwhile, American table etiquette, according to European visitors, was woefully lacking. As one English woman claimed, they are a nasty people, the Americans. <laughs> there is no denying the fact. <laughs> Elite Americans especially grew weary of European haughtiness and culinary matters, you know, and we see this in other aspects of American culture too. They got tired of Europeans criticizing America's um, literary endeavors, its artistic endeavors. The unadorned, straightforward fare Amelia Simmons and others had celebrated as specially adapted to Republican simplicity in America began to seem simply mediocre. Why shouldn't America adopt markers of European sophistication to prove its own cultural capabilities and capacities? Um, and so with that in mind, the French, thus, the French quickly become America's culinary heroes. As cultural cosmopolitanism began to appear, preferable to provincialism. And I think it's a fitting um, revenge that Americans look to the, Fran to the French to emulate um, because the English who had been so critical of Americans were themselves very um, sensitive to French culinary arrogance. High-end dining venues jumped on the growing interest in French cuisine and used it to attract clientele. In fact, in restaurants like the Tremont House in Boston, French influence was evident throughout the entire dining experience. Um, for instance, much of the elaborately carved, dark walnut furniture came directly from France, had been imported from France. Um, it had once been assigned to, in America and in Europe, to blanket the table with a copious number of pre-prepared dishes so that when diners walked in the room, they were you know, taken aback by the, the abundance. Um, but now, competing with French standards of style, uh, demanded that meals be served as a series of courses, with each course distinguished by unique behaviors and rituals. Upon entering the Tremont dining room, affluent patrons were first shown to their seats and handed a bill of fare, also known as a menu. And I've tried to give you uh, a menu. Um, they were next left to look over the offerings before a waiter returned to ask what they would like to eat. Waiters then retrieved a succession of individually plated dishes rather than expecting diners to help themselves, as had once been the case. This became known in America as dining in the European style. Similarly, modern billing schemes replaced the all-you-can-eat approach, which, was, which had been known as the American plan, with dining a la carte, or dining in the dining according to the European plan. Um, finally, the menus at most refined dining venues consisted predominantly, if not entirely, of French food. And you can see that on the menu I've given you. Um, first of all, you'll notice that at the top is a very prominent picture of the Tremont House, you know, so that when you sit in your seat, you have this very, ele the, the image of the very elegant, um, stately building in which you are dining reflected back at you. Um, and then you, you'll notice that not only are the dishes, you know, examples of French cooking, but also the, the, the language is French. It's, it's a bill of fare written in French. Um, this is interesting. Uh, first of all, okay, so status conscious Americans insisted on having uh, menus written in French, even though most Americans at this time were not familiar with the French language. French wasn't taught in schools in the antebellum period. So, um, you know, you could get this menu and have absolutely no idea what it meant, but you, you were sure that you were dining, you know, very elegantly. Um, and if you look carefully, you'll see that, you know, this, this lack of familiarity with French um, resulted in some interesting combinations and interesting um, spellings. Um, you know, just reflecting that Americans were a little bit naive in some ways. Um, doubtless the actual fare was usually often less than, than truly authentic as well, especially because cooks in this time were rarely trained in French methods of cookery. So probably um, many of the dishes that you would have received and eaten at the Tremont would have been kind of a hybrid of American and French cuisine. 
Um, for their part, guests were expected to demonstrate their own high level of refinement through an appreciation for French food and mastery of table etiquette that by now involved a growing array of highly specialized tableware. Um, simply navigating a menu, again composed in a language one did not know, could be a tricky endeavor. But through mastery of these intricate dining rituals, elite Americans were able to confirm that their elevated place in society was deserved. Success in acting refined was thought to prove good character and worthiness for economic and social eminence. The first class restaurant provided the perfect uh, test of refinement and it was also the ideal stage on which to enact re refinement. Um, the prevalence of French dishes in American first class dining establish establishments did not necessarily win European approval of uh, American food, though it did seem to help. Um, there were um, um, French restaurants in America that attracted worldwide fame. Um, but elite fascination with French cookery continued to garner criticism from Americans who insisted French cuisine was overly lavish and that in any case the nation should be focusing on developing its own national menu rather than copying that of France. French cuisine was not the only commercial dining trend that came under attack. On the contrary, some Americans saw evidence of deteriorating Republican values in the practice of dining out as a whole, part of a much larger reverence for domesticity that developed alongside the market economy. Reformers began to urge Americans to avoid the potentially harmful effects of dining out altogether and return to dining at home where their wives and mothers would do the cooking. Um, so by the 1850s and 1860s, reformers um, insist that avoiding commercial eateries and dining at home shielded Americans from the debasing effects of urban modernity. After all, eateries were deeply connected to the changes that had swept through the country, including urbanization, immigration, industrialization, since <coughs> the turn of the century. In contrast, the domestic dinner table became a vehicle for imagining the renewed moral authority of the family and a return to traditional values. This was especially the case among middle class Americans who made domesticity central to their class identity in this period. Middle class reformers called dining out bad for both digestion and morality. <laughs> All classes of dining venues came under their censure, even those that catered particularly to middling people. Meals at home, on the other hand, were idolized as quiet, cheerful events. Particularly at midday, domestic meals were thought to reconstitute families that had been split apart as a result of industrial work patterns. The dining home, the central attraction of the, no, dining room, the central attraction of the home, according to one reformer, and the gathering of family within it would reawaken domestic sentiment. Women, who were guardians of both the diet and the soul, were now charged with overseeing mealtimes in a way that would further the moral development of their families and encourage their husbands to dine at home rather than in a restaurant. An outpouring of cookbooks published at mid-century offered women suggestions for making meals at home as enjoyable and as wholesome as possible. These manuals increasingly acknowledge that Americans now had a growing interest in foods that were less straightforwardly American than those Amelia Simmons had recommended in 1796. Above all, the prevalence of French food in refined restaurants had cultivated a growing curiosity about and attraction to French cuisine. This was true even as the appropriateness of French food remained a subject of debate in America. Titles such as Domestic French Cookery, The French Cook, and Home Cookery, a collection of tried receipts, both foreign and domestic, attempted to resolve the tension between admiration for French cookery and discomfort with the foreignness it represented by recommending that American women learn to cook French food at home. When women ignored these collections of advice and dined out, it inspired even greater anxiety and condemnation among reformers than when men participated in the trend. Um, reformers charged women who took advantage of ladies' dining venues with neglecting their domestic duties, they said, why, why are these women dining out um, when they should be at home, cooking, getting their husbands to come home for dinner too? Um, you know, why are they wasting their husband's money? Mm -hmm. Women's virtue was also interrogated within the eatery. Female diners were suspected of frequenting eating venues in order to consume alcohol. And this was 
this was despite the fact that ladies' venues ostensibly, you know, were dry and didn't serve alcohol, um, and even to meet their lovers. As one writer described the scene in a New York confectionery that was popular among women, yonder um, are a middle-aged man and woman in deep and earnest conversation. They are evidently man and wife, though not each other's. <laughs> <laughs> The seriousness of these accusations reflects how grave a threat to the moral order reformers considered women's participation in commercial dining. Um, and as I described, eateries attempted to, to uphold separate spheres by providing women with an atmosphere that was at least somewhat divided and shielded from the general public. Um, but critics could not overlook the fact that such venues facilitated women's further participation with the public sphere. Uh, moreover, women's eateries subverted gender roles, I think, in a very serious way by providing spaces where women were cooked for, and again, usually by black and Irish men, instead of doing the cooking themselves. So to summarize, um, dining venues inspired by the broad transformations in society and culture that took place during the first half of the 19th century, dining out also contributed to these changes. In turn, dining out became a focus for the anxieties that modern urban life inspired. Elevating the status and importance of domestic dining became a way to both cope with and push back against some of this change. Um, somewhat paradoxically, I think, home cook, uh, commercial dining blossomed alongside the idealization of home cooking in America. Um, and also, inspired by the cosmopolitan fare available in restaurants, home cooking also became more diverse as a result. And you see this continuing in, later in the century. Um, you know, Chinese restaurants inspire Chinese cooking at home, et cetera. Uh, however, a combination of commercial eaters didn't stop the trend of dining out. People continued to do it. The middle class continued to do it, even though they were the ones who were most nervous about it. Um, but it did shape it. This Critiquing it did shape it in, in certain ways. Um, for instance, I think that reformers' insistence on cooking as a treasured female duty it was one of the reasons um, why commercial cooks were incapable of garnering any kind of respect for their craft in the antebellum years. Uh, when cooking was done at home to sustain a family, it was a valued female obligation. But when cooking was done um, in a commercial setting to sell to a paying public, it was servile and degrading and best left for um, men with few other occupational options. Esteemed commercial cookery did not compete with antebellum Americans. This also explains why few women found jobs as uh, cooks in commercial kitchens, because for a woman to sell the culinary abilities intended to benefit her family made these abilities a part of the immoral market economy and debased both the abilities and the woman who sold them. Um, another really important way that um, anxiety about commercial dining helped to shape it was you do not really see Americans dining out at night in the antebellum mm -hmm. period. It is confined to the afternoon when it can be justified and legitimated as a matter of necessity. Um, dining out at night for leisure and amusement um, was very undeveloped in the antebellum period and that's really something that changes after the Civil War for various reasons. So. Um, after the Civil War, the changes to American dining habits that were set, sort of set in motion in the antebellum years in important ways um, continue. Dining out becomes more prevalent. Again, it's both it, it, after the Civil War, it, it happens both in the afternoon and in the evening. Um, the fare available in commercial eateries becomes much more diverse, and that's a result, again, of immigrants from different parts of the globe coming over and, and um, diversifying. It. Uh, also, Americans increasingly are attracted to these ethnic restaurants and the foreign food. And I think most surprising is the fact that after the Civil War, it's the middle class who, sh you know, sheds this anxiety they had had in the antebellum period and really becomes the most culinary adventurous and sort of, you know, herald the Chinese the Chinese restaurant. So. Um, just to conclude, Americans first learned to incorporate commercial dining into their everyday lives and indeed into the very ways that they define themselves and one another. Beginning in the antebellum years, restaurants confirmed um, that Americans were growing apart from one another, but they also provided a shared experience. 
uh, more importantly, restaurants help to develop an interest in and even a taste for cultural diversity. Thank you. Question. Okay. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, um, all right, well, when you talk about waiters and cooks in restaurants being mostly Irish and, and um, black, what, how did, what was the population of servants at that time um, in terms of, of you know, their, their ethnicity? In other words, I mean, a waiter is a servant, right? A cook is a servant. Um, were, that, that what, what, exactly. were male, what were male servants as a rule? And, and what, were, what were domestic cooks? So, so first of all, male servants were less uh, common than female servants mm -hmm. domestically. Um, but they too were usually drawn from black and Irish populations. Um, and actually, has anyone is anyone familiar with the contrast? Tyler Perry, yeah. In the beginning, there's this great exchange where the American servant doesn't want to be called a servant, he wants to be called a waiter, because waiter was like this euphemism. Um, it was thought to be less degrading than the term servant. Um, but after, once restaurants become prevalent, that euphemism is no longer available for servants because a waiter is emphatically different from a servant. And I, th I argue especially that for African-American men, they really try to hold on to their positions as waiters by um, leaving this movement to bring attention to the, the skill and the, and the expertise that waitering required. What about household cooks? Household cooks were usually <coughs> really women. Mm -hmm. um, Irish? Often Irish, black too. So it's similar. It's but that that's one of the. Um, it's just interesting to me that you could be a cook in a in a private household, but you could not be if you were female. You were not a cook in a commercial. It, that position wasn't really open to you in a commercial establishment. Yeah. Was the the position of the head chef? I mean, did that exist? The person who ran the kitchen? Did those people have an identity, or were they just sort of this anonymous? layer of cooks. As far as I can tell, you're, it's just one mass of cook, and it's not until later in the century where we get culinary schools um, where people are able to, people are able to say, cook is, a chef is a, is a skilled position. Yeah. And then those positions are given to white, specially trained men. Mm -hmm. And I have this great image from the 1880s of um, a line of white chefs wearing their uniform, like you didn't wear uniforms if you were a cook in the Antebellum period. Later you have, you know, your toque and your white outfit and then all of the waiters were black. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> There's only things that, like, okay, you talk mainly about Boston, New York, and, and Philadelphia. You're forgetting that uh, San Francisco uh, and also uh, the, there were Great restaurants there in the uh -huh. antebellum period, also in uh, in in um, um, New Orleans, which they also had the Irish and black. Yeah. <laughs> and the, and and also you're forgetting also uh, Savannah, Georgia, which has a rich. And you're you're from Georgia, right? Oh, I'm not from there, but yeah, I live there. Okay. I thought so much that I'm forgetting them as I just had to you know put boundaries on this project. And and about the. But also about the hierarchy of, of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of disagree with that in, in some areas. Like at Monticello, uh -huh. uh, Thomas Jefferson started a lot of things there. And he had an hierarchy in his kitchen. And a lot, in fact, a lot of foods were introduced. Right, in, He brought them from Europe to Monticello. And, 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 there, were, and there were French um, um, uh, historians that came to Monticello. And they, they were amazed that here in the wilderness, that was a wilderness area then, they were amazed in the wilderness he had all this culture. Yeah. Food yeah, and everything. Yeah. I, um, I loved your talk. It was really interesting. And um, I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, could you say more about what happened after the Civil War to make dining at night more respectable and acceptable? Yeah. Um, part of it is that as work continues to change, um, it, People are doing less domestic or less, uh, you know, the annual labor. They don't need these big meals in the middle of the day, um, and so sh you see a shift in meal times where more emphasis is placed on later in the uh, later in the day for the meal. Um, so that's part of it. Um, also, 
so the so the the upper class, you know, they're not as restrained by these anxieties about commercial dining in the antebellum period. They are engaged in, in dining out a little bit at night. After the Civil War, though, changes in the middle class make them increasingly they they're interested in dining out as a form of cultural capital. And so so then you have masses of middle class people who are looking to take their meals outside of the home too as as a new kind of leisure activity. But I think that it wouldn't have happened without the overall shift in, in meal times. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, a wonderful talk. Uh, Thanks. I wanted to ask about the interactions among or between waiters and, and those they're serving. It strikes me that there might be a kind of an uncomfortable relationship if you have black and Irish waiters uh, serving a, a middle class who can't largely interpret the menu, can't read the menu, and, and might not know. And even an upper class who can't. R right, yeah. and, and these kind of dining rituals. So they have to defer to, to a class they would consider beneath them. Like That, that seems like a, a setting for an uncomfortable social relationship. It, is that the fact? I mean, can yes. you pick up on that? Yes, and I, um, the, the waiters are just fascinating to me. Uh, and how do you, for some of those reasons. Uh, the, for the source material, like how do you get into that? I'd love to hear more. Oh, the source material. Um, yeah, newspaper, well, the middle class is re especially really nervous about interacting with waiters. And again, this is mostly something that happens after the Civil War when the middle class sort of embrace dining out. But they still are very uncomfortable with depending on this man to help them navigate their dining experience. And they feel at a huge disadvantage. Also because in French restaurants, the upper class um, could tip the exorbitant amounts of money they could tip. And they and the middle class felt like that was just completely unfair because they got better service. Um, the the waiter was you know less uh, condescending, um, more willing to help that help explain quietly what the terms meant, more willing to quietly suggest a wine that the, you know they tokens that would help them um, you know get uh, acquire cultural capital. And so the middle class feels very disadvantaged by that. And that's part of the reason that later in the century. They start going to Chinese restaurants. They say going to Italian restaurants because um, their meals are sort of like uh, it, they just bring them out. You don't really have to order; <laughs> it's all you can eat, and so that el eliminates that source of discomfort. But yeah, I, I'm fascinated by the whole interaction between waiters and mm -hmm. their patrons. Yes. That's another question I'm really interested in um, that happens much later. I, th I think that that's more of a 20th century phenomenon where you take your children out to eat. But again, late in the 19th century, you have middle class people start to speak up about the fact that dining out isn't family friendly mm -hmm. and that if they don't bring their children, they have to provide childcare. Again, they're just, they get, in, it, by the end, they, you sort of have, my last chapter is about sort of the invention of the middle class restaurant where they can make it more amenable to their needs. But I think dining out with children is later. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I have a, a couple of questions. One is, um, the, when did you say the, the sort of embrace or turn to French cuisine? Uh, it starts happening in the, well, the Tremont House opens in 1829, and it's complete, this menu is totally French. So, so it's so late 1820s. It, mm -hmm. I wondered, is you um, uh, explained it um, as as reflecting uh, both sort of European um, evaluations or assessments of the the the, um, the value of French cooking over as sort of France as kind of the gold standard of, of European cuisine, and that that um, is picked up by Americans in part in response to European criticism of American, you know, vulgarity. Um, is it also a response to any other kinds of cultural developments or even political developments, this sort of turn away from England and towards France and embracing sort of all things French or all yeah. things European? Or, it definitely and I wondered is. if you could say a little bit. I can, I can speak to it somewhat. I mean, you see this in, in um, through I think, throughout American culture. I, I, I know architecture, Bostonians are fascinated by French architecture, and they want to copy French architecture and, and have French furniture. Um, so France is, yeah, definitely a model. And I, sh I should um, pay attention. I, ne I need to pay more attention to 
um, that phenomenon overall. The, the neoclassical movement started, that started in the 18th century, Jefferson started that. And, and there was a lot of French and a lot of other European architecture that was, that got, it, it's prevalent in Washington, you know, it's just yes. the, the Exactly. So it has real political um, associations, and so if you were sort of one political, you know, affiliated with one mm -hmm. strand of politics, you would embrace sort of French culture, and if you were affiliated with another, you would reject it. And right. so I wondered if those kinds of political um, Yeah, and it's something that I'm aware of, but, ha but have neglected. So then my second question, yeah. just to leap in since I have the floor here, um, <laughs> is, um, is whether or not you look at uh, the kind of spatial organization of the um, cities that you studied and whether or not certain kinds of restaurants emerge near their clientele or their... Yes. And I actually tried to pay a lot of attention to this. I went through city directories in five-year increments throughout the 1800s and got addresses and then like flexed my technological powers by <laughs> putting them into um, GIS mapping mm -hmm. programs. And so I can actually, I have maps of where the, the eateries spring up over time. And they're definitely, you can definitely see that, um, that they were attached to, uh, to, to different classes working, mm -hmm. neighborhoods, etc. And so they were, um Attached to sort of work, uh, uh, associated with workplaces or kind of shop areas, or shop retailers. Right. Were they associated with other other kinds of um, entertainment or you know sort of a theater district or? And you can area? chart that later in the century. You can see more of that. Um, yes, I so can't. Was, unfortunately, was, from the city directories, you can't always tell the class of clientele to which a particular right. venue catered. So right. I can I can only kind of. Um, I mean, you can definitely see that the eateries are located in the downtown business districts most prevalently. And so eating is associated with other kinds of activities, too. The later, of commercial dining. Yes, later in the century. Yeah. I'm really interested in this transition from the banquet tables and the working men's board yeah. to this sort of <laughs> almost illusion of privacy within these dining rooms. Mm -hmm. and and how exactly that transition happened and when it happened for the upper class, I'm assuming it didn't happen for the working class, that they were still at the, the board. And, yes. And how did that play out in the middle class, for instance? Um, so the part, of, okay, the shift, because again, when the trauma opens, it's one long banquet table. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, that's phased out. Part of it is because once the city, um, dining out became popular very quickly once the options were available and, and Americans wanted to eat since it was a matter of convenience they wanted to eat when they wanted to eat as opposed to at the Tremont dinner was served at 12 noon and mm -hmm. you either were there or you weren't there they wanted to be able to drop in when they wanted mm -hmm. and so partly the separate tables facilitated that so you didn't you didn't come in in the middle of other people eating and sit down next to someone who was finishing, mm -hmm. um, and often and then Americans say that you know they don't want to eat next to the stranger next to them, mm -hmm. um, so they like that. And it the, I think as far as I can tell, it ha the the upper and middle classes sort of coincide mm -hmm. regarding that development. But in low class eateries, you have long tables and boards throughout throughout the century. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things Chinese and Italian eateries do to cultivate a middle class clientele is rip those things out and get separate tables with tablecloths mm -hmm. because that's what the middle class expected. And when it broke up in individual tables, did you largely have single diners at those tables? Um, single parties of diners, yes. But a single, so there were parties, parties. of people dining together. For instance, clerks from one office, <coughs> I, I, we'll talk about in their diaries going out to eat as a group. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I mean, it's sort of a semi-famous story of the scandal that was caused when Melville and Hawthorne dined together. And this was in this wasn't in a city. This was in well, it was in a town in Salem. But by their choosing to dine together when they weren't travelers, it caused a scandal because they were doing it socially. Oh, like for men dining business, together. Business men dining together. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Um, what year was that? Yeah. I don't know exactly. I have to. I have to look. Because um, anything can cause a scandal in those days, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because the clerks from offices would go or um, merchants would meet together to dine at 
take dinner, or take wine. Right, there were business yeah. reasons, I mean, mm -hmm. basically. Oh. Being from the same officer, there were business reasons rather than doing it oh, socially. I, right, okay, so maybe, I mean, I don't, I'm not familiar with that incident, but uh, what, did they do it in the evening? I think they did it during the day, but they dined together, socially. Interesting, interesting. Because, it, I mean, throughout the evening. And they didn't well, dine with Hawthorne's family, which yeah. was what it was assumed should have happened. That mm -hmm. Melville should have been entertained by Hawthorne's. Name. Was it the fact that it was that it was done at a restaurant then and not at home? Yes. Okay, that makes that's really interesting. I'd like to find that. Um, it's in it's in Herschel Parker's biography okay. of, uh, of Melville. Okay. Do, do you know anything about the uh, early restaurants here in Minneapolis? I don't. <laughs> this is my first time to Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of them here. <laughs> Was there was uh, the very first restaurants had that, that you know I know it sounds like when they first started and suddenly they just mushroomed and everyone was doing it but were were the Europeans doing it first was this sort of a fad that came across the ocean definitely okay uh, Europeans were dining out all the way into the medieval period they had cook shops where you could go buy like a pre-prepared joint of meat or something like that and mm -hmm. take it eat it along with your ale out in public but this just wasn't done in America I think because um, urban life was so much less developed in America. Yes. Uh, I, <coughs> I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Rebecca Spangler's The Invention of the Restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, where she talks about the reason which in fact in France, the restaurant began as uh, a place where people actually went to restore themselves, where there was a lot of uh, the discourse of health, right? That it was a place that you didn't just go to enjoy the social uh, mm -hmm. aspect of eating, but you actually went there when you were ill, when you had you know, mm -hmm. stomach yeah, problems. Yeah. And there was a lot of literature also associated with, uh, just a lot of literature talking about the importance of the digestion system and how uh, you, you know your digestive system is not working well, you have all these kind of all different kinds of ailments. Mm -hmm. Do you see that kind of literature also accompanying uh, the, the, the beginning of the restaurant uh, that you talk about where you know there's a, there's a lot of talk of the importance of the digestion for just the overall well-being mm -hmm. of, you know, of Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on that question. Um, one, you definitely see a lot of talk <coughs> in America about the fact that what you eat um, determines your health. But it's not centered on restaurants. Restaurants aren't thought of as a place where you go to restore yourself, as in as in early pre-revolutionary France. Um, but if, if anything, it's the opposite. Um, in this period where people are, oh, we should eat out. Ah, um, they're saying that the food is bad for you. That it's poorly cooked and it's overly greasy. It's too greasy, and um, you should eat at home. You're, you're going to eat too much if you go to a restaurant. Your wife will restrain your appetite if you if you take your dinner out. <laughs> <laughs> very much of concern. So if any so so no, I guess. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a good question. Um, as far as I can tell, music does become in vogue later in the century among high end dining venues. Um, so to have background music or like a string quartet but not till later. Of course, different cultures at different times did that too. The ancient Greeks and Romans did that with music. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, the, and also in the, in the, in the, uh, the, the Renaissance too. Yes. Hi. Hi. Were there differences in decor in restaurants for men and restaurants for women? There were. were those differences. Okay. Um, as far as I can tell, um, the, the ladies' eateries were not any less opulent or magnificent as the as men's dining rooms, even though the main dining room was, was the main attraction in a nice hotel like the Tremont. Um, I, 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 this is something I want to do more with in terms of material culture. Um, so ladies' eateries uh, were usually smaller. They often were separated from the men's dining room only by like screens. So often it was able to hear what was going on in the main dining room, even though you were shielded from it. So I don't think that they were too different. I think that they would have just been on a smaller scale. 
Um, I know that the Tremont's dining room for ladies was had large plate glass windows, which is really interesting. The fact that the ladies could see out into the street what was going on, and also I assume the street could see in mm -hmm. what these ladies were doing. So even though they're shielded, again, they're kind of out there in public too. Mm -hmm. And, and men who were accompanying ladies could go to the ladies' dining room. Yes. So the dining room that's gender segregated is actually the main dining room. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And um, <coughs> after this war, again, women can go into the main dining room as long as they're escorted. Uh huh. But up until the 20th century, I think Emily Post was once famously denied access to a to a men's dining room at the mm -hmm. hotel. Was a lot of these dining rooms you're talking about, were they on street level or were they uh, on the floor up? Uh, that's what I'm wondering. Um, it depended. Um, they could be below. I mean, like oyster saloons were usually below street level. They could, uh, ladies' eateries were often advertised if they were above, if they were elevated. Um, the trema, I know, was on the main floor. Because the reason why I'm asking that is because back in those days, and, and, and I mean, there was, there was horse manure in the streets. There was... There was, there was, it was, it was a, it was a, it was pretty filthy back then. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, people just, maybe it didn't, maybe it didn't bother them, or maybe they. Well, were. Well, that's one reason that, um, you know, these refined public spaces were, uh, you know, called for, so that they didn't have to deal with the cat <laughs> rubbish and. But you said there were windows to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that's an inter I guess that's that's kind of an interesting question. What what they could see and what they couldn't see. I, I have a picture later in the century of a beggar boy, you know, like with his face pressed up against the window of this yeah. really nice restaurant. Well, I remember there was, a, there was an historian that pointed out that if we could transport ourselves back only 100 years, we would be shocked by the barbarity. Of, the filth. Because we would think it was barbaric in the way they lived. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One more just um, thing that maybe you can expand on because it sounded really interesting was the claim that, that Tunis Campbell was making for mm -hmm. sort of black selfhood as part of the profession of being a, a waiter. Could you just tell us a little bit more about that? I can, yeah. And that's actually the subject of my chapter for the workshop tomorrow. Ah. Um, so uh, Tunis Campbell, sort of overall the effort was to sort of make a claim that, um, you know, black workers were Republicans and um, we're specially skilled in this occupation, and we should we should we should mark that job for black men and not let Irish huh. immigrants degrade it. Huh. And I have a great story of a um, of a waiter who was a fugitive slave, and he's actually um, kidnapped by well he's not well he's found by slave catchers at his place of business and removed and taken to the courthouse. And this is Shattered Minkins, if anyone's heard of him. And, and they, at the end, the newspapers make this big deal out of the fact that he's wearing his waiter's apron, which Trunus Campbell says should be, you know, that, that waiters shouldn't wear livery, they should wear dark clothes with a crisp white waiter's apron on top of it. Hmm. So that sort of becomes a symbol for, um, you know, free black workers and the honor of, of the waiter. Oh. I love waiters. Do <laughs> 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 they have to supply their own? Uniform and um, the apron. Tunis Re Campbell recommended that um, that the that they supply their own clothing, but that the aprons be kept at work so that they could always be crisp and white. And mm -hmm. you mentioned tipping, and so tipping was normal and done. I mean, was that? Do you know the history of that? Has, has it always been around? As far as you know? yeah, I, I'm actually working on an article about that. Um, I know that tipping was um, thought of as a European aristocratic. Um, idea in the before the war, in the, that we shouldn't that it was degrading to tip your waiter, um, but by the later in the century, that's how you get service. That's how you get you know, and, and um, as consumption becomes more conspicuous, yeah. you want your waiter to bring you food, you mm -hmm. know, that you haven't even called for that, and that can all be secured through tipping. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>